Welcome, welcome to the Rub Mouth Show on TSRnetwork.com, where real people talk about real sex with really kinky people. I mean, today we're going to have a really kinky show, but um, New Year, I mean, Christmas is coming up, so I want to wish everybody a very, very, very happy, happy, merry, merry, merry Christmas. Hanukkah is tomorrow. Happy Hanukkah, and so many other um, religious, you know, um, practices that are celebrating this wonderful holiday season. And I'm really excited. Let's see, anything spectacular happen this week? Mm, no, nothing. I have had a layback weekend, except I went to the Lourdesad on Saturday night. I taught a class. There was about 45 people in my class. It was awesome. I enjoyed it. Had a great, great time. Um, we did a class on how to find your perfect mate and what is collaring all about in the BDSM lifestyle. If you're new to BDSM, this is the place to be. We are the real Fifty Shades of Grey. We don't we don't, <laughs> you know, the book is interesting, but we are the real one. So, but I want to get to my guest. My guest, um, several months ago, I was um, notified by this wonderful guest to come on to her show. Um, she's on Playboy Radio, and I didn't see, I didn't see the email for a long time. And then all of a sudden, I wrote her back and says, "Yes, I would love to be on your show." It was a great, great experience, and we're just going to find all. All this information about her, we're just going to chat like two girls just sitting down drinking a cup of coffee. So I want to introduce my guest, Dr. Lamore Blockman. Welcome. Thank <laughs> you, darling. Thank you so much for having me today. Who Such is a that pleasure. Cute, who is that cute little dog on your that lap? That cute little thing is Lola. Hello. Hello, <laughs> Lola. <laughs> She's my baby, and um, she is a very interesting color as well that I use that is kind of like a BDSM color and you know when I went to this is an interesting story because when I went to buy her collar they offered me this uh, little pinky thing and I said you know this is not a Paris Hilton dog <laughs> this is a bondage <laughs> princess so yeah so that's her story <laughs> is, is, is she a rescue dog yes she is a rescue dog and uh, but has been doing very well since she got here, and you know she's very well taken care of and happy. <laughs> I hope she's going to stay for the whole show. <laughs> Hopefully she'll behave. <laughs> Listen, if you're watching the show and you're not in the chat room, please come to tsrnetwork.com. Join the chat room. Uh, we have a few people that are watching, quite a few so far. So we have we have uh, in the chat room at the moment. We have Art Miller. We want to increase that, and we will as the evening goes on. It will increase. People will go in and out, and in and out, and in and out. But this is your opportunity to be able to ask questions of of Dr. Lamore. So Dr. Dr. Lamar, let's talk about, did you, where were you raised? Did you grow up in California? No, not at all. I was uh, born and raised in Israel. Um, actually served the army and did the whole thing, you know. Um, I, it took me very long before I got to California. Actually, I only arrived for my PhD, which I finished in, I believe, 06 it was. And ever since, I've been around practicing in the States. But both my bachelor and my master's that were in public health and psychology and behavioral sciences, my PhD is in human sexuality, to be exact. Um, so both of them were achieved in uh, at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And then I went on to study for my PhD, which was a phenomenal, very inspiring experience in San Francisco. And I always like to mention, because it's one of my, kind of, it has nothing to do with me, but it's kind of a bragging right, because one of the deans of uh, the institute where I graduated from was Pomeroy, who was one of Kinsey's uh, posse. So wow. that's, that's really, really enchanting, yes. So you're, you are so petite. And, I mean, <laughs> she, is, she is really, she is this little, teeny, little, petite, little little thing you must have looked fucking hot carrying <laughs> a gun a rifle <laughs> it's it, it has been an experience yes and you know um, first when you just uh, join you learn to use an Uzi and uh, as a machine gun it's a very heavy um, rifle so it, it was really kind of funny for me to try and maneuver it. Later on, I had a short M16, and that was better. But it was exciting. Yeah, you know, women in, in uniform and with guns, it's kind of cool. <laughs> well, we 
we have we have little T who has come into the chat room and she's probably gonna fall in love with you because you're so beautiful <laughs> and she'll probably fall in love with the doggy. She's she's on the east coast, so um, you know we're gonna have people wandering in and out. So if you're watching the show, please let your friends know that um, the Dr. Lamore um, Blackman is on TSRnetwork.com on the Rev Mouse Show. We greatly appreciate it. So when you came. When you came to the United States, you, you went to school up in San Francisco, and how long were you up right. in San Francisco? Well, it took, you know, more or less four years, uh, because as a, in, in PhD, you don't spend that much time in school, but rather writing your dissertation, which was quite a hassle. You know, you have a committee of people that check every little comma and every little uh, period and everything that has to do with it, and it's very frustrating, especially for a uh, control freak Israeli as myself, and yeah, I would give them hell. I remember the dean would snap at me and say, you know, leave me alone, get out of my office, I don't want to see you anymore, and it was, you know, every semester that you keep going, it's frustrating because you want to be finished with it, but, you know, as we, I think as we mature, we learn to appreciate the journey more than the goal. And I think that's kind of a, a process of maturing. Well, when you were when you were going to school, I mean, you didn't you didn't have any family here. How did that? How did how did it feel to to leave your family in Israel and then to come to the United States and be rather alone? Of course, I don't know all the it facts, so very, it may not be. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's true. It's and it's a very good question, which I deal with a lot and and battle with a lot because it's still it's still the the uh, the conditions. Uh, right now in my life because my family currently all of it is is still in Israel I don't have any family here I have close friends that are like family but I do not have family here and I, I it's hard honestly it is very difficult especially under conditions like uh, the ones that we just experienced uh, what what was going on in the Middle East and for me knowing what it is and what people are going through even though being raised as a female in the Middle East in this catastrophe over there, you know, as a, as a um, single democracy in this lunacy, um, it's difficult and it kind of makes you a tougher person, but it's still to view all of it from out of the country is very difficult, very challenging. And um, I really advocate, I think everybody should get a glimpse of what it means to live under not ideal circumstances as we, we are, uh, you know, very fortunate enough to have here. Well, I know that we're kind of spoiled as Americans. You know, we're we're <laughs> all on our and we're all on our iPads or our iPhones. And by the way, <laughs> she is on her iPad. So, you know, this, this is new te technology how it has come a long, long way. But yes. uh, we seem to tend yes. to get a little spoiled, and we we worry about little things that really doesn't matter. I mean, living underneath um, what's what's happened with Hamas in in Israel was very devastating to so many people. And plus, Absolutely. on both sides, it was devastating. Yes. But especially it for was. for the Israeli, who you are constantly underneath, um, you never know if there's going to be a a a attack of some sort of a bomb or someone you know having a strap on bomb on there you never know what's going to happen I mean do you no. think that, that has helped to build the character of who you are absolutely I have no question and I'm very thankful I think in retrospect we all tend to appreciate all the difficulties that we went through because it kind of builds character and I always try to explain to people that um, this this phenomenon that has been taking place since the beginning of the country and way, way before in history. But in general, the whole idea of being that little democracy, and I have to mention for people that do not really know the fact, Israel is the size of New Jersey and quite, you know, shaped the same, very similar. But the size of New Jersey, a tiny, teeny little country that is surrounded by enemies. And um, it's so prevalent, the idea of knowing somebody that was, you know, a family that lost a child or someone that lost something within this terror, you know, um, just reality of terror is, is a very known fact. Nobody lives out of it. And I always like to give the example of the, one of my best friends who was, you know, a partner of mine while I was getting my uh, master's uh, in Jerusalem, who is now a, a very brilliant guy that is postdoc that practices uh, in New York. And when I was dating him, he had one eye because he lost an eye uh, in a terror attack. But this is just a reality. 
You know, it just, it doesn't matter. People live under these circumstances and serving the army and being a part of it, which I would never recommend to dodge. And unfortunately, this new generation is less, you know, committed, but I, I'm hopeful that it will change. It's just a reality, and I do feel that it did build, you know, who I am today. Do you think you'll ever go back to Israel to live full time? You know, it's it's a always a question, um, and it really depends on life circumstances. I believe I would love to spend more time there if I, you know, if I'm able to. But I always tell people it's such it's such a long travel, and you know, it's a lot. I truly hope to spend more time. I don't know if full time of living there, but hopefully I'll get to spend more time there than I do right now. So you you got your degree and um, you came down you came down straight to the Los Angeles area after you got your degree, or did you go anywhere else before? No, I was traveling. I lived all over the place um, because I'm you know I'm I'm not from here, and Israelis tend to be. Uh, wandering around the world and I lived in many places so I did live in Manhattan and in Florida and all over the place so yeah I practiced all over and this was my last stop um, uh, the last few years that I've been here. It has to be really interesting to live in Israel and then to come to the, to, to the Los Angeles area and to, you have your you have your practice, and um, uh, for the people that are watching, she uh, has a PhD in human sexuality, and she has a master degree in public health and communicate community um, uh, medicine. Medicine. And so, how did you become? I'm gonna. Uh, I mean, <laughs> you are you are one sexy lady who has the. <laughs> oh, thank you. You talk about sex. I'm. I mean, you're an author. I mean, the Nate. Can, can you please share with people a little bit about your your wonderful, wonderful book, um, Three yeah. Six Five Daily Tips for Outrageous Sex and Intimacy. And let's talk about yes. sex. <laughs> yes. Yes. Absolutely. I uh, I was always very passionate about writing, and I think it's an interesting uh, kind of journey that I, I that brought me into who I am today. Because when I was in high school, what I wanted to do is be uh, here you would call it an English teacher, but I wanted to teach literature because I fell in love with um, with French erotica. It was one of my favorite, you know, things, uh, kind of genres. Uh, Anna Isnin and uh, uh, all of the uh, the others that were, you know, in this genre were so inspiring to me that I, this is what I wanted to do. And you know, as I progressed in my educational uh, kind of journey. My father always wanted me to be a lawyer, and I said, you know, oh my God, I'm going to fall asleep and die out of boredom. For me, it was really a boring kind of branch to, to go to, and um, honestly, I didn't know I was going to be a sex therapist, but once I kind of established what I, what I planned on doing, I was still very passionate about writing, and so it happened that I started, I am a published author in Israel. I have three books and one here, and um Hopefully, we'll have another one soon. I'm, I'm working on that. So, I think that uh, creativity and everything that has to do with with your inner erotic self is a big part of um, kind of finding the process into being the the sexual, sensual person that you are. Mm -hmm. For me, it always worked, you know, uh, via writing, and so I'm very happy to do that. Well, you've been interviewing a lot of people in the BDSM community, which right. is a, amazing because we really need good coverage. We really need yes. people to understand us, you know, that we're not uh, as twisted. Well, some of us are kind of twisted, <laughs> demented. <laughs> but you, you've, been, you've been interviewing a lot of us, and I think it's, it's awesome because of the fact that, um, you know, we have a lot to offer in the community, um, and even in the vanilla community. And... Um, Share with me some of the people that you have been interviewing on on your show that have been into BDSM besides me. <laughs> on my show, you've done quite a few, <laughs> <laughs> and you are a very important guest that we had. And you know what is interesting that a lot of my guests uh, are kind of related, you know, in a way to your work because we always kind of mention your name. As we have a discussion on the show, oh yeah, and I work with Rev Mel, and you know we always mention you, which is interesting and, and fascinating. So um, I had uh, Miss Diana, mm -hmm. uh, who is such a lovely woman, and I found her just enchanting. She was, she was just such a beautiful guest, you know, to me. 
um, I just enjoyed having her so much, and she was such an inspiration. And um, I have a Lord. I had Lord Baba, mm -hmm. <laughs> who was also such a lovely story. And with him, it was really enchanting because I had to kind of be careful. I don't know if people are aware because uh, you know Playboy sounds like a lot of openness and fun, but we do have a lot of restrictions. And when I presented his skill set, that was, you know, one of the most interesting aspects of his practice was uh, knife play. Mm -hmm. And I found it interesting, but, um, you know, everybody around me that, that runs the show, basically, uh, on, on the production level, was kind of concerned. Uh, so we had to kind of circumvent around it, because I, I was really intrigued in... in kind of presenting that skill, which I find fascinating, and it's very different. So he was another fascinating uh, guest. And uh, I had Lady Kilchandra as well. Mm -hmm. um, different people, you know. Um, I just, everybody that I come across that is presenting such a, a different kind of uh, experience or a lifestyle or, an, you know, something that they uh, like to... Um, travel through, I would call it, to me, to present that kind of aspect to my listeners is the most important thing because I do believe that the general society and the vanilla, you know, society in general uh, doesn't really understand what it means to be a part of a community. And Lord Baba was very specific about it, that he's so uh, accepting. Because I think that in the general uh uh, public, the society, society in general is very judgmental and very has a lot of preconceived notion, which is less common in the BDSM and King community, uh, and that is a big surprise and a big uh, comfort, I find. Well, he's he's amazing. He he talked yes. to me about um, when he was in the hospital. He had a yes. he had, had a very very difficult time, and he couldn't couldn't do anything or anything. He watched. He watched all of our shows. He stayed connected yes. with us through watching the shows, which was amazing. Yes, he said that, and he said it on air. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said yes, and he said that he uh, that you are such a source of inspiration and comfort. Uh, and you know, this is this is yours. Nobody can take it from you. And I think that what you inspire people to feel and and go through and and deal with uh, because of your strength is is a great gift. And so here I am. <laughs> do, you, do you think that? Do you think that hand, that um, that people that are vanilla that are coming to you, that mm -hmm. are coming as as a therapist, and they're right. coming to, and they're coming to work with you, and the ones that have come have never done anything with BDSM. Do you think that the knowledge that you have learned from interviewing all of these uh, amazing people, do you think that Absolutely. has helped you with your practice? Absolutely. I think we always learn. I mean, I always tell people, as much as I'm uh, well-educated in my field, I feel that from every individual that I come across um, that has obviously a different experience for me because it is imperative to mention that I basically, if you ask per se, specifically, I don't really practice in the community. But because I find the community such a the kink and the BDSM community, such an inspiration in terms of cerebral, open, inspiring people, I find that this community is by far more my people than any vanilla practice. Because of communication, because of the fact that everything is being discussed, because of the fact that um, in the poly community, in the BDSM, in the kink community, Constantly there is an exchange and a discussion between couples, parties, no matter what kind of uh, correspondence is it. And I find it very lacking in the vanilla uh, lifestyle, and that is something that I try to kind of instill in, you know, uh, people that come to see me that are vanilla. I try to give a little aspect of that community and what it means and how can they really uh, embed it in their lives to better them, to mm -hmm. make their partner a better friend. You know, I always say that Nietzsche said something very true, and that applies to many, many relationships, that what makes unhappy marriages is not lack of love, but lack of friendship. And I think that many uh, vanilla relationships lack friendships. 
they, they're not really friends because they don't share. Uh, there's more concealed than revealed, I would say. Yeah, we do have a huge community that we share so much together, and um, because mm -hmm. you know, you know, our local dungeons. I mean, I would love, I would love to bring you to the to the Lear de Sade as my guest. You would be able Absolutely. to. Absolutely. You know, they 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 have a um, a night called Conquest. Conquest is where um, it's it's all about education. So it's not mm -hmm. as threatening. It's when a lot of new people. It's the classes that I've been teaching for twelve years. So. A lot of new pe people come into that class, you know, learning, and it's not threatening, and they get to meet us, they get to know us, and they get to know that we're not the the people that sometimes the press represents us to be. And yes. uh, it would be awesome to have you come to the Lear de Sad. And you can bring a date. <laughs> <laughs> I will, absolutely. I even have someone in mind, so yes. <laughs> but yes, anytime you want to come, just ask me, and uh, it would be awesome to have you. So, that would be honored. So, I'm going to ask you some real personal questions. Absolutely. How old were you when you <laughs> when you lost your virginity? Fourteen. That's about uh, the that's about the average age, isn't it? Yes. Uh, well, you know, I find I come from, and that's another thing that I when I talk about Western society. I find that there's a there's a need to distinguish America from other Western uh, countries because um, there are different kind of cultural uh, implications. I would say I was raised uh, under very family oriented kind of society. You know, still when I go back, I don't do not have children, and when I go back home. It's always a question. How come you don't have kids? You know, it's kind of judgmental, and and that applies to uh, your practice of sexuality as well, other factors, and has nothing to do with religion. I want to say because people assume that Israel is kind of a religious country. You know, if you're not familiar with things, I was very secular, Jewish but secular. So um, it was fairly younger than my peers, but I I do want to say that. The guy was actually uh, my boyfriend, and uh, we were, you know, it was the last year of middle school, I, I believe, and um, I was always a very safe kind of uh, girl. You know, I was responsible. I took pills, you know, and everything. I was doing everything by the book, but I was fascinated with sex. I always found it, you know, kind of uh, intriguing. And I actually discussed this guy today because he now lives in Australia and he's still my Facebook friend, you know, that first love. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. That first love is always something that makes a huge impact on your life. It does. I, mean, it does. I, I married yes. my first love. <laughs> oh, that is so beautiful. And where? <laughs> and, you know, and then we had a daughter and then we had a divorce and, so, you know, and being a single yeah. mom. So it was yeah. It was awesome. It was awesome. Yes. Yes. But yeah, so I yeah, thought I was fourteen. That, yeah, I found I was more preoccupied with sex when I hit my forties. In my in my late thirties and early forties, it was just like I could and I we can swear on the show, we can do anything we want. I mean, I, I could fuck a doorknob. Yeah, you know, that's that's how I was <laughs> always, always horny. I hear you. <laughs> but it's very true, you know, hormonally, you know, women uh, reach their sexual peak between thirty five and fifty five. And uh, so that, that is kind of a promise, you know, that women have in their future. And I always like to explain to couples that are from the same age range that uh, once a man is kind of, you know, on the way, it's kind of a downward spiral uh, and they're not as able or, you know, willing to. And, and I want to touch this cliche later on that men are always ready and willing. It's so untrue. But uh, the fact that men are more functional between the ages of 18 and 30 and women between the 35 and 55 puts a like it, it's kind of a problematic uh, feature when it comes to same age couples because women are only you know kind of awakening to a new life of exploring sexuality once their partners are you know kind of in a decline now it's again it's a generalization but women are more uh, into and keen on sex later on in life. Yeah, I I, I kind of look at things like when God, my sound my sound is all off. When when you're you're young and you meet someone, the man is always the aggressive person and very aggressive in sex and very aggressive in his life, and it yes. seems to switch 
that they become more passive and women become more more aggressive. Why do you think that happens? Well, uh, partially also because of the reason that uh, the, the, the this awakening that is taking place within women makes them uh, the sexual aggressor. Uh, in terms of uh, being in quest of that sexuality, I always like to give the example of Little Red Riding Hood, which I find fascinating as a, a kid's story. It's a fable that is absolutely not for children. But the whole idea behind that story uh, is that the question always arises, who is the aggressor in the story? And many, uh, many different analysis, you know, uh, attempts were made to kind of make uh, the story more of the real thing and not the way it's described by the Green Brothers. And there's even a, a, a very interesting interpretation that applies to women later in life, even though the, the, the child in the story is presented as a child. But um, the idea, uh, Kiki Smith, the, um, the uh, artist, created a sculpture that she called Daughter, and it presents a girl covered in, uh, in, in fur. And the idea behind it is that Little Red Riding Hood had herself a really good fuck with the wolf because, before she skins him and wears his fur. And their love child is that uh, sculpture, which she calls daughter. So how we interpret you know, women as the sexual aggressor is really up to society, but society is very strict, society is very conservative, but it is true that women, once they uh, awake the sexual beast in them, you know, uh, are much more interested and, and much more in quest of their sexual satisfaction, which often men are not able to satisfy, unfortunately. And numbers show that close to 20% of society, and again, I'm relating to the American society, uh, close to 20% uh, of couples, of married couples, live under the terrible conditions of uh, sexless marriages. And most of them, at least 15% of these 20, uh, at least 50% of these 20% of society are on the men's account, meaning that these women are not getting any. Wow, so it's the man that is refusing the sex. Right. Could it be yes. because some are having affairs on the outside and they're getting satisfied somewhere else? Could be for many, many reasons. Some of them are emotional, some of them are obviously functional, and some of them are just have to do with the lack of communication or lack of compatibility. Because as we said, women are on the rise, men are on the you know kind of decline at that point in their functionality and other factors. Uh, and the fact that we are raised to believe that men are always interested in sex is so untrue and kind of devastating because women um, are, are mistaking, you know, this lack of, of, of sexuality in their lives as something that is related to them, something is wrong with them. I always like to tell people, and I see a lot of these patients, unfortunately, uh, that it has nothing to do with them. And sex is, nobody signs up for a celibacy unless it's their choice. But if you marry somebody and uh, um, sex ceases to exist in your relationship, this is wrong. If you're mm -hmm. interested in it, uh, there's no way you should live with it. It's one of the reasons why that happens to men is because men, you know, men marry the good girl. Men marry the girl yes. you can take home to mommy. And then you yes. start having sex with them and all of a sudden that little good girl all of a sudden has become the horror. And does it bother men? Yes, absolutely. Look, uh, the, the Madonna whore dichotomy is a very known uh, syndrome in, in men that many men even subconsciously deal with, and it is difficult. I mean, it is something to be managed. But to top it off, um, regardless, I think that men uh, have this belief that everything should be, you know, according to what they were raised under cer certain, certain conditions that society kind of dictates to us. And once it's different or once, you know, uh, we grow into a routine or once uh, things are not really as Hollywood presents them, uh, things stop to exist. And this is what, this was my, my problem with, with our initial discussion about the vanilla relationships, that so many things are just being you know, dusted under uh, the rug, that it leaves a lot of unhappy marriages, a lot of 
unhappy, a lot of uh, non-friendships, as I called it, and people that are just frustrated. Now, again, uh, a, a, a good example of it is I had one of my guests on the show early on was uh, the CEO of AshleyMadison.com, that I'm sure everybody knows, mm-hmm. uh, Noel Bitterman, who made, I believe, close to, I don't know, uh, a few millions last year out of running a business that, you know, advocates uh, infidelity mm-hmm. because of, of people's uh, lack of, of ability to have a discussion, to have, you know, people will say no to poly lifestyle, but will say yes to betraying and cheating and lying and other factors because this is okay. And that's, I think, the problem in, in society today. Well, I, I wonder if... Um... We're going to talk about the male, the male ego mm-hmm. at the moment. Yeah. I wonder if a male ego, if he constantly has to be stroked, that, that he is like a little boy and he, he doesn't feel good unless someone is paying attention to him. He doesn't feel like he's a man. And we're talking about, I mean, this is also for, for straight men. I'm talking about not, I mean, I mean vanilla men and, and men that are into BDSM. The, the mm-hmm. conquer part of who they are, is that into their DNA, the conquer part? Yes. It is, um, and I think we, let's let's divide it into the fact that do that men do need that stroke that stroking of libido of their libido and their ability and their functionality. Yes, it's true, and this is like a word, you know, a shout out to women as well because we all need to feel valid and 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 relevant and attractive and stimulating, arousing, fascinating, beautiful. All of these things, we all need that as human beings in general. And I think that on both ends, uh, partners have the tendency to forget that. Now, uh, the fact that men need uh, their their libidos and and their 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 uh, ability to function, stroke to to be stroked into that, yeah, obviously it is very relevant. Many women forget to do that as well. But again, if there was some discussion about what I need, what you need, uh, then it would take place. What does happen in reality is that it's more likely for these men or these women, but we're talking about the male libido for now, uh, or the male you know, interest, whatever it is, uh, it's easier for these men to go and search for that stroking somewhere else uh, other than you know, kind of opening up to their partner, which should be a partner, and that's the key word, the key title, and explain to her uh, look, uh, you're not really supporting uh, anything that I go through. Uh, maybe I have some 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 form of a dysfunction. Maybe I'm I'm a premature ejaculator. Maybe I have difficulties uh, with firmness. But um, you're not really reassuring me for my manhood. And this is one of the things that we fail to as couples to kind of maintain. I do want to say as well that people have the tendency to forget or mix love and lust. And I always like to tell people that love is very different from lust. The former uh, it can be prolonged and prosper and, you know, grow as we are as a couple. Uh, which, and while the latter is a cold-hearted bitch that needs fueling, and uh, it's very expensive to fuel lust. And so when people expect Hollywood, they only show us the couple riding into the sunset, but they don't show them 20 years later. And that's yeah, I, the problem. I agree with you. When I've, I've been to swing clubs. I mean, swing clubs mm-hmm. taught me the difference between lust and love. To watch a couple yes. have sex with other people all over the place, and then to hold hands and to walk smiling, holding their husband's hand, was a remarkable experience for me. It kind of, it, yes. I kind of felt like I was... I, don't, I think you can you you can you can understand this that I finally learned how to play the football game. You know where men will go on the football <laughs> field, they'll they'll yell at each other, they'll cuss each other horrible horrible names, and then they'll all go have a beer and pat each other on the back and have a great time. That's what it felt <laughs> right. like. Right, the separation of the two. Yes, but in in the BDSM community, we still I don't think we're I really don't think that we're that much different than the vanilla world. Because no. we also have some of the complaints that I hear from female submissives is that their dominant no longer makes love to them. Their dominant no longer right. fucks them. Their dominant is always looking for somebody else that, that um, they can add to the family. And they, and they feel yes. worthless. How would you, somebody came to you, how would you 
How would you help them through that process? Well, I think that, first of all, to bring things to the surface is the, is the main thing. And uh, unfortunately, you don't see that that often. People prefer to kind of hide and go look for other outlets other than trying to solve something. So that's the first step, to kind of bring it out. And uh, I, I always insist when someone wants to see me, if that relates to their partner, I, I won't see them separately because um, it's not helpful. I mean, uh, to me, I'm not making any progress if your partner is unaware and it's this clandestine, you know, uh, experience that you're having. Uh, I cannot help you because if you're not opening up to your partner, it's kind of, um, you know, not a, a mutual experience and I cannot help. So I think that the couple needs to be aware of the lacking that has been going on to begin with. And then uh, I do feel that people need to take into con consideration that uh, a long-term relationship has uh, the, the key factor of routine. Now routine is a good thing in terms of you know each other, you know what you like, you have your comfort zone, it builds, you know, kind of support system. And as, you know, uh, I spoke to the, to the CEO of uh, Ashley Madison and he said many th true things. Some of them had to do with the fact that long-term relationships uh, or, you know, marriages uh, withhold a lot of good things. You know, you have kids, you have mutual assets, you have a story together. But you cannot expect this uh, explosive arousal to be, maintain, to be maintained in a long-term relationship because it's just non-human. We cannot do this. But what we can do, and this is why I, for, for one, uh, don't practice monogamy, but what we can do on that end is really to understand that certain uh, functions can be filled by different partners. And uh, while we have love and support with our uh, primary relationship, with our primary partner, if we want this explosive feeling, it may not be um, something that we can, it may not be feasible in our long-term relationship, which doesn't mean that we need to uh, break it apart. So I think uh, that a, a couple that is really interested in, in kind of keeping that relationship together and intact needs to address it and not, you know, just ignore it and, and pretend like it's not there or you know they always society uh, vanilla society would tell you something is wrong you need to try this tour you need to try this seminar you need to go to your swing club you need to do this and that maybe all of these things will not help because uh, what really builds especially male arousal but also female arousal is novelty and variety and these two factors are, you know, unfortunately cannot be sustained in long-term relationships, especially marriages that are one-on-one. -on -one. Well, let's talk about long-term relationship. We're mm -hmm. living longer yes. now than, than in history. And can yes. we get married at the age of 22 years old and expect to have only one partner, a happy life for the rest of our life? I mean, this is what we're taught as children. Your, women are taught your prince will come. You know, yes. your prince will come, he'll come and save you. You'll live happily ever after. And so many of us mm -hmm. don't. I mean, is it feasible for us to have that long-term relationship last forever and be happy? Is it really that feasible with the amount of time that we're, we're aging? My father's 92 years old. I mean, yes. I could not, that to me, I can't phantom. Yes. Uh, well, I personally do not think so. Uh, nor do I think that we should strive for it because I think that regardless of uh, that enchantment and and I have a little uh, I'll say it now you know it's interesting you know that this, the source of the word fetish uh, is actually it's interesting people I'm in love with etymology if I weren't a, a sex therapist I would have been an etymologist and an anthropo anthropologist so I find the whole background of words and, and uh, cultures very fascinating, and the source of the word fetish comes from Portuguese, which is feticio, which uh, translates as to charm or sorcery. Uh, you know, kind of in a way of, of magic and charming. So the whole idea that if we want to keep this enchantment, that fetish uh, that is related to our conversation, we have to keep in mind that uh, something that is prolonged, as, as you said, we live longer, uh, cannot be sustained 
in a long term one relationship but it doesn't mean that something is wrong with us it doesn't mean that our partner doesn't love us because again I have to you have to kind of separate love from lust and it doesn't mean that the the Hollywood version that is sold to us or the fable you know they sold to us of Prince Charming uh, is feasible or true and I always like to give the example of uh, the fables comic book I don't know if you're familiar with it but I encourage everybody to go look it up it's really fascinating but in this in the comic book there uh, they present um, Prince Charming as the biggest you know polygamist he has <laughs> every princess all over the place he's, and he states I'm very good with falling in love but I have a problem with the forever after and that's really kind of sums it up, you know, in a way, because we grow up to believe, oh, I want to be this princess with this prince. Well, tough shit. That's not going to happen. Uh, that's not reality. Well, how can how can one do? Okay, let's let's. We have a tremendous amount of people in the BDSM lifestyle that are into poly. I mean, our poly families are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And sometimes I look into the eyes of some of the people that are involved in these huge poly family. And I'm going to get you know, raked over the crow for this one. Uh, yeah. Sometimes their eyes look a little dead. They look a little sad. Uh, and then I see people who have poly relationships that have an open poly relationship where everybody, you know, they can, I mean, I'm going to be interviewing a wonderful young man where his, his girls can go be intimate with other people and he can go be intimate with other people. And they are absolutely the most delightful people to be around and they are happy. I mean, yes. what can go wrong in poly relationships? Well, I think what can go wrong in any relationship, um, we, you know, going into any, any relationship can suffer from routine and any relationship can suffer from lack of communication. So I think that in any relationship, and that applies to if we have multiple relationships uh, and we have rules around them because this is how we function, you know, in any, any form of relationship, be it, you know, uh, uh, platonic or romantic or professional, we have some set of rules to, to uh, run our relationships by. And sometimes, you know, even unexpectedly, we uh, twist the rules or it's out of our uh, responsibility, out of our uh, control that things happen. For instance, I see couples, and I, 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 it happened a few times that I came across poly couples in poly relationships um, that kind of, you know, promised their prominent, their, their primary relationship that, the others were not as significant or there's not going to be uh, that level of love or, or commitment there. And things happen, you know, and that can happen in any relationship. But I think that if you shelter and, you know, shield somebody from that possibility, that's not going to matter. I mean, things have their way of just progressing into whatever needs to, ha to happen. What, what would be noble and wise to, to do is to kind of accept the fact that this is life, you know, and uh, some people grow into different directions, and hopefully you can maintain your friendship and 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 uh, romantic relationship with your chosen one. But there are no there are no guarantees in life. It's not a you know insurance policy. We cannot we cannot really count on it. Is it is it a bandage? Is it fixing something that has failed? I mean, this is I mean. Sometimes people have relationships, you know, um, have an affair because it's a bandage to fix something that they have not talked about and they have not been right. able to repair in their marriage. Yes, absolutely. And that I think that that bandage, look, and I come across women and men that say, you know what, my affair was the best thing that ever happened for my relationship. And I accept that, you know, uh, uh, it can be, it can be helpful, but oftentimes it's not because uh, people find deceit and lying uh, much more hurtful than the actual act of, you know, whatever it is, if it's, if it's sexual or emotional. And it's very interesting to see that men are much more hurt by uh, their females, their partner, female partner, uh, having casual sex with someone, while women would be much more uh, in pain over an emotional connection that their partner had. So we are all kind of plagued by our, you know, heritage and, and our biology. And this is what it is. We need to uh, accept the fact that life happens 
And you know, I always like to say when people ask me about the fact that I am um, that I am a big believer in poly uh, lifestyle, uh, that I am not uh, mistress of anybody's uh, you know climax. I cannot I have no interest in controlling someone's you know arousal because once you are in a relationship, that means you're committed, but you're not dead. Mm -hmm. And uh, people expect that once they are in a relationship, that nobody can. You know, you're not exposed to the external world. Nobody arouses you. You're not. That's bullshit. That's ridiculous. And it's very imperative to understand that. We are sold a different formula that is confusing to us, especially if we don't, if we're not that cerebral and we don't analyze ourselves and everything, you know, our emotions or what we feel. Mm -hmm. so, In yeah. the chat room, we have, um, we have Art who has said, um, they seem to see, be focused on the communication and the breaking the routine, very intriguing. And um, little T says, or it won't work successfully. That's my opinion, just to be honest all the time. I mean, please, people that are in the chat room, please, we want to open up for questions. Um, what we're going to do right now is we're going to show... Um, we're going to show her website, and then we're going to open it up. Um, please put your questions in the chat room. There are people that are watching. If you're not in the chat room at posting your questions, they won't be heard. So please um, put them out there. Come into the chat room and join us. And so I want to show her her website. One second. So let's talk a little bit about this website, okay? Yes. <laughs> camera, okay? So this website is pretty exciting. <laughs> Thank you. So tell me about it. <laughs> So, so what, well, my site, yeah. Yeah, I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to scroll down so they can see it, and then you can just, if you want me to move to a different page, I can do that also. Well, again, now I can't see you. You know, the iPad is the... Uh, oh, the iPad uh, screwing up. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not seeing exactly where <laughs> you're scrolling, but I know that my site, so I'll just refer to it. Look, the idea is, and I always like to say that uh, obviously, uh, I'm not your typical kind of, uh, you know, mainstream therapist. And the reason I do find that uh, much more relevant is because I, for one, you know, my own experience with professionals has always been uh, their passion or their commitment to what they have to offer. And my analogy would always be, you know, I would never go to a, a dentist that has bad teeth. So. I feel that the fact that I am a very passionate sexual uh, woman uh, should be advocated and put out there. And for that reason, I've been, I was a glamour model in my early 20s, and a lot of these pictures kind of represent that. But in general, I feel that the fact that I uh, appear the way I do is, it does not negate my skill set, uh, but rather, you know, kind of enhances it. And for that reason, my site is kind of provocative and, and more, you know, sexual and less clinical. Because honestly, I find it as a professional boring. You know, uh, I would not be interested in presenting that kind of uh, 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 practice or treatment. And I don't find that it works for me. Uh, so I do have you know a specific kind of clientele I'm not you know I, I'm I, I like to say that I'm an acquired taste and not for everybody but you know it's it's anybody's choice to come and see me if they uh, if they really rely on my uh, professional ability uh, which is vast then you know that should be represented in, in, in what I provide them with well, let's talk about something on your site. You have Dr. Lamore's Bedroom Secrets, Women Only Seminar. Share yes. with me, what is it like to go to one of your seminars, and what are some of the things that you tackle? Well, what I like to tackle especially is, is the, the myth that women, uh, you know, are the last, the, the coy sex. Um, I have a big problem with that because women are not. Women are actually the, the first sex, you know, unlike... Uh, Simone de Beauvoir's book, The Second Sex, I think women are the first sex. And women are uh, by far more sexual than men. Uh, just by our uh, orgasmic potential. And I think that once you kind of connect to that wild side, that natural, that primal side of yours, uh, uh, you are able to achieve so much happiness in, in your sexuality that is very unfortunate because I come across women that are in their peak 
say, 40 and have never experienced an orgasm f to begin with, uh, which, which happens quite often. And or, you know, kind of hopeful that some specific, you know, uh, legendary Prince Charming will help them find their uh, sexual peak or, or uh, you know, ability. And I find it just very, very unfortunate. So in my seminars, what we do is I, I limit it to 15 women because I try to um, kind of term it in the time that I spend with them for every woman to kind of put in an anonymous question that is the most intimate thing that she ever had and uh, she ever had to ask. And uh, once we sit around in a very intimate setting, I bring out this, these questions and answer them in a very thorough way. And that applies to people, you know, women in this circle are able to get their answer, kind of eat the cake and have it too without being exposed, you know, that this is what concerns them. So it's kind of a mini therapy in a way. So what is the most intimate thing you have done? <laughs> <laughs> the most intimate is that, do you refer to anything sexual or per se intimate? I, I'm going to leave that up to you because I think that <laughs> we look at intimacy, uh, all of us kind of quite different, and not all intimacy yeah. is just sexual. Absolutely. Well, I think that in terms of intimacy, my most enchanting experience was um, a man that I met while I was um, studying for my PhD, which was a very very keen, you know, very like a, a, a soul spirit. And our uh, intimate experiences were so uh, overwhelming and beautiful and uh, supportive, but we could not, you know, and this is a prime example of how our uh, sexuality or our ability to be intimate is not necessarily what applies to a good long-term relationship. So on that note, we were very functional as a close, you know, kind of bond, but we were very different individuals uh, in, in our general lives. And so this could have never been, you know, we couldn't sustain it. But I'll always cherish it. And in my third book, Back in Israel, uh, that was my third release there, I talk about it because he was, you know, one of my experiences there that kind of held me above water because I always like to say that my experience in San Francisco was not all peaches and cream. It was quite challenging, and I, I learned a lot about myself from being a PhD student of human sexuality. How did your family feel about the career that you have? <laughs> That's a very good question. Well, my father still accuses me for all his gray hair. <laughs> He's still believes this girl, what the hell, why she couldn't, why couldn't she be a lawyer? So um, it's interesting because it took, for instance, for my father, who comes from a very, you know, uh, European Jews, very traditional, his generation, you know, uh, right after the Holocaust came to Israel. And it, it's a very different kind of generation, but it took him many, many years. And for me to achieve my PhD, for him to say, oh, my daughter is a doctor, whatever the hell she specializes in. It took him a long time to come to terms with it. And now they're my biggest cheerleaders. But it, it took quite a while and for me to kind of establish a, a firm career um, in my field and be a professional for them, uh, my mom was always a piece of cake. She's my soulmate and always was very accepting. But my father was a challenge. So how did you get onto um, Playboy Radio? She has an awesome show. You can find her, <laughs> and she'll tell you all about the time that she can, you can find her. I, it was yeah. wonderful. I mean, how did you get in touch with Playboy, and how did you start your show? It's, it's also interesting because I always like to say, and you related to it uh, in terms of my upbringing and my background, because I have the Jewish or Israeli chutzpah, you would say, to approach things. I'm not afraid of rejection, you would say. Uh, so um, the easiest way to put it is that I just uh, contacted the GM directly and offered him a platform for a show. And we went back and forth, and we ended up with sexperts. Uh, airs every Friday uh, at noon Pacific, and um, you know it was it was a very interesting and intriguing uh, 
kind of journey towards that 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 formula that I've created there. But uh, I, as as you saw, I take all the responsibility for creating it. I conduct the pre-interviews. I talk. I pick the guests. I decide on the theme of every episode because it's really kind of something that I'm very passionate about. If I don't find a story interesting, it's not going to be on my show. So this is kind of, you know, um, how I, I came to it and how I achieved everything in my life. Uh, and that applies to every step in my journey to become, you know, that professional that I always strive to be. In the chat room, Little Chi has a question. She says, is your practice open? I think she's asking you, can she come in? <laughs> <laughs> yes, my practice is open, and I also do Skype sessions. Uh, that's also a possibility. It was, it was really amazing because when I went to your show, I mean, you guys have yeah. to understand something. We're in the green room, you know, having, you know, coffee and, and lots of, um, lots of, there's, you know, all these little snacks that were there. It was awesome. And yeah. she comes out, this little teeny petite, beautiful woman with no bra on, just a, a stretchy shirt, no pants on, and I, and you had high, very big high heel shoes on. Yes. <laughs> well, I was wearing these little, you know, I like to call them underwear uh, jeans. You know, these little petite things that I really like. It's kind of like my stripper attire. I always, you know, it's like I dress, and, and you related to the fact, yeah, I don't wear bras, makeup, or jewelry. I just, I always like to say that. I just, I, um, this is what I'm comfortable with. And a part of my policy and, and kind of my, uh, my this, is, this is my message to people is that I don't, in, in really simple words, I don't give a fuck. So I really do and carry myself the way I like and feel comfortable with. And I always say that if someone is uncomfortable with that, it's, it's, it's a representative of them mm -hmm. and not myself. And so to me, you know, it's I am who I am, take it or leave it, and I always present everything, I put it right on the table. And I find that that's the most honest way to kind of put yourself out there because I would never hide behind, you know, a, a white jacket or dress up modestly or differently because I need to be accepted. Uh, and honestly, yeah, of course, essentially I practiced in a place where, that is more, you know, open-minded and everything, you know, I'm not uh, practicing in Iran or anything. But the thing is, you don't I'm want to wear a burqa. <laughs> yes, not a burqa and I would be stoned to death in a minute. But the thing is, truly, you know, this is where we are. Um, and again, I get a lot of uh, eyebrows, uh, eyebrows lifted and looking at me in a stranger, and that's fine. You know, again, as I said, it says more about these people that are judgmental than about me. And I think the most important thing that everybody needs to take the message is to, uh, to be yourself. I always like to quote um, uh, Waldo Emerson uh, that said that... Um, to be yourself in a world that constantly tries to make you into something else is the greatest accomplishment. And that's kind of something that I live by. Uh, it's, a, it's a great quote. Listen, Miss um, T in the chat room, Little T said, uh, no, 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 that's not what I meant. She says, I meant, is it acceptable or are you only for BDSM kink people? But I think you've already stated that, and please elaborate that. Oh, from my practice, yeah, I see a lot of people in the BDSM uh, and kink community, but I also see vanilla couples and vanilla individuals, of course, everything that has to do with human sexuality I see in my practice. Well, we're only going to have, we, we're going to be wrapping it up because we're coming to the end of the show, but I want to ask you two questions and we'll go through them kind of fast because I know your time is precious. So, <laughs> any regrets? No, none whatsoever. Um, no, and I don't think that it's ever necessary to regret because at the time that you, you know, conducted yourself in a manner that this was, you know, it was exactly what you were aiming for, I believe. And for people that are coming and watching the show for the very, very first time and going, what the heck is this? And uh, this has been a wonderful interview. What would you say to someone that is brand new that is coming into, um, whether the BDSM swingers or poly families, what, would you, what kind of advice would you give them? I would say educate yourself, first of all. You know, know who you are because many times and oftentimes I see people that have uh, an assumption of what they want to be 
or an assumption of how they see things, how they perceive things, how they believe it's going to make them feel. And then once they dip their uh, feet in these waters, they feel very uncomfortable and they want to run. Uh, so first of all, before you take the step in, uh, examine yourself and see that you want to be a part of it. Educate yourself, ask yourself questions, read, talk to people that have experimented, and also take pleasure in the journey. Don't run, don't be goal-oriented. I know that as an American society, as threat society, I like to call it, we are goal-oriented. We like to reach a point. We like to get there. But the journey is by far more enchanting than the actual goal and the actual destination. So just embrace it and, you know, be happy with yourself. It will, you know, an inside job of happiness is actually exuding on the outside. Wonderful. And how can people get a hold of you? They can go to my site, drlimor.com, so drlimor.com, and they can find all the information there. And, of course, I invite them to follow Sexperts on Playboy Radio every Friday, 12 p.m. Pacific. Um, that's it. I'm here for you. Any question that you have, I'll be happy to answer. Wonderful. Thank you so much for coming on to the show. I really, really appreciate this. I love Thank having you. Will darling. you come back? Absolutely. It was such a pleasure, and I want to thank everybody that is all your fan base uh, that is uh, vast that, that joined us. I'm very happy to uh, be familiarized with when I thank you for having me. Thank you so Thank you so much. Okay, everybody, we've come to the end of the show. You've been watching The Rev Mouth Show on TSR Network, where real people talk about real sex with really kinky people. It's where we are changing the world one vanilla at a time. Love you all. Love you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.